Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Welcome, my name's Chandler. I'll be leading us through our service today. Whether you're new to our community, this online experience, or if you've worshiped with us many times before, I want you to know that we're really glad you're here. We want to encourage you to worship together with others. We have community groups meeting together virtually as we worship today. And if you're not in a group, we also have a public group that you can join, and our host will share a link in the chat window. As we worship together today, there will be words in bold on the screen that we invite you to say along with us. We recognize it can feel weird to speak or sing in our rooms on our own, but I want to invite you to push through the awkwardness as we worship God together with word and song. Let's prepare our hearts to worship together. O oh Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Give us the joy of your saving help and sustain us with your life-giving spirit. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God who was and who is and who is to come, the Almighty. Alleluia. Please sing with us.
found a fortress in the living God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and my voice will tell of all his saving grace through the depths of which no man could measure. In the days of plenty, in the days of want, I will put my trust in you alone. Well, there's no heart greater than the Father's heart, and there's no love sweeter than the Son. This love pursued us is a mystery, for the heart is base and you are holy, yet the streams of mercy that flow over me will afford me grace to stand in glory, where with men and angels, where with slaves and I will sing my praise to you alone, for there's no heart greater than the Father's heart, and there's no love sweeter than the Son's. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus Christ, my everything. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to my King. Hallelujah. This love pursued us is a mystery, for the heart is base and you are holy, yet the streams of mercy that flow over me will afford me grace to stand in glory. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah to my King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus Christ, my everything. Jesus Christ, my everything. You are our everything. Help us to live with content of your presence, to be one with you, and to live in your love. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. As we continue to worship, we'll move into a time of confession. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. I invite you to take a physical posture that reflects a posture of humility in your heart. You might sit or kneel. Together, let's open our hearts before God, turn away from our sin, and turn to Christ. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. 
Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Take comfort in these words from the Apostle Paul. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Knowing that Jesus lifts us, lifts us up out of our sin, receive these words of assurance. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, the gospel is good news of great joy. Let's rejoice together. All the earth shout and sing for joy, for great in your midst is the Holy One. Alleluia. Our scripture reading today is Philippians 4, verses 10 to 20. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you, Philippians, yourselves, know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Paphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, wherever you are, welcome. My name's Alistair. I'm the lead pastor of St. Peter's Fireside. I'm really grateful that you're joining us today. Uh, before we dig into God's word, let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks that you are with us wherever we are, no matter what is going on in our lives, and that you're the one who offers to teach us how to be content. So Lord, as we open your word, we ask that you'd apply it to our minds, that we not grow shallow, that you'd apply it to our hearts, that we not go, grow cold, and that you'd apply it to our feet, that we not just be hearers of your word, but doers also. We pray all of these things in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Paul writes, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Who wouldn't want to know this? Who wouldn't want to get in on this secret of contentment? I think most, if not every person, would want to know how to be content in any and every situation. But Paul says it's a secret. It's not that Paul's going to keep this secret to himself or that it's reserved for a select few. He's going to share it with us and anyone who's willing to listen. But I think he calls it a secret because so often we fail to find contentment in life. Because contrary to what Paul says in this passage, our contentment is often dependent upon our circumstances. We know how to be content in some situations, but not any and everything that might come our way. You know, we're all too content to accept that our contentment is going to fluctuate. It's easy to find contentment when our lives are going well, but when they start to uh, decline or whether the, the journey to where, where we're going gets hard, our contentment can sometimes disappear and we find ourselves discontent. And so we go through this cycle of contentment to discontentment, and that's our normal. And on a more practical level, most of us 
We're just struggling to be able to face our bills or our days or our commitments or our family or our friends or trying to find the ground beneath us during a global pandemic. Contentment, that just seems like a pipe dream. So what is the secret to being content in any and every circumstance? Well, first, I want to look at the culprits of discontentment, and then we'll look at the secret of contentment. So let's begin with the culprit of discontentment. I don't know if you've heard the good news, but Conan the Barbarian, the movie, was remade in 2011. I'll give you a moment to regain your composure. Now, in the movie, Conan the Barbarian says this, I live, I love, I slay, I am content. Now, my concern for Conan is not just his bloodthirst nature, but it's what happens when there's no longer anyone to love. What happens when there's no longer an enemy to pursue? What happens when the quality of life that he's accustomed to living is no longer there? What happens if the rug gets pulled out from underneath him? How will his contentment hold up then? You see, one of the culprits of discontent is that our contentment depends on us getting everything dialed in just right. Our contentment then depends on circumstances. Once we have the job we enjoy, the provision we need, a certain level of comfort, so long as we're insulated from hunger or not experiencing suffering, or we have the relationship that we want and our family is at least uh, some form of healthy in its relationships, then we can be content. It's easy to think if these things are dialed in, then everything will be okay, then I'll be content. But then it's just as easy to become discontent because all it takes is for one thing to get dialed back or another thing to be too intense and we find that suddenly we're not content at all because we're depending on things being a certain way in order for it to be well within. Another culprit of discontent is that we think we can consume our way to contentment. We live and have been raised in a consumeristic culture. And although we think we know better, all too often we can fall into the trap of thinking that this next thing I buy, this next uh, outfit or this next widget or whatever it is, this thing will make me feel more satisfied and more content in life. And so sometimes that even works. You buy the thing and it arrives and you feel good. And that feels, uh, it actually lasts for a few days, maybe in a few weeks. But then over time, the cycle repeats. And in consuming, we ultimately end up being consumed and our contentment is driven and tossed back and forth depending on whether we can have the things we want or not. When I was much younger, I was in and out of the doctor's office for various blood work and vaccinations. And let's just say that at that age, I did not know the secret of being content in any and every circumstance. I actually developed quite the reputation uh, for being afraid of anything encroaching upon my epidermis that happened to be sharp, like needles. Actually, when I called my mom to help verify the details of the story I'm about to tell you, she said, wait, which time are you talking about? My fear of needles was that bad. So my dear mom, knowing how discontent and unhappy needles could make me, made me a wager. She said, if you go and get your vaccination, your shot, and you don't freak out, and you don't cause a scene, and you just receive it, even if it's painful, I will buy you a new G.I. Joe action figure. And G.I. Joe action figures at that time were all the rage, and so I thought, Fair wager, Fran, fair wager. So I believe this hope of getting my favorite toy, it would be enough to settle me so I could be content through this situation because I knew I'd be content when I received that toy. But I was wrong. We arrived at the doctor's office and this kind nurse took us down this terrifying corridor and the flickering lights and we got into the sterile room and I just freaked out. And I gave up on the G.I. Joe. I tried to get out of there and it took four nurses and a doctor to restrain me to give me a simple vaccination. Now, later that day, 
I said, Mom, you know, I, I know I fell short on the vaccination, but could I still have a G.I. Joe? And I'll never forget the look of disbelief that came over my mom's face when she said one word, never. Another culprit of discontent is misplaced hope. When our contentment is based upon things or upon things or circumstances we're yet to obtain but hope to attain, it's going to let us down. Because first off, we might not ever actually get there. We might not ever obtain the thing we want and then we'll be discontent. Or even if we do obtain it, even if I got that G.I. Joe, eventually it's going to wear off and we'll be discontent again. And so we're always in this cycle of going back and forth between contentment and discontentment. All the same, we still have legitimate moments of contentment, don't we? But have you ever worried about jinxing all the good things that are happening? Your job is good, your family's good, your friends are good, your finances. You don't want to blink and miss out on this blip of contentment. And so you hold on tighter. But is this the secret of contentment or is it just comfort? And if it is contentment, doesn't the worry of losing your contentment ruin it a little bit? Wallace Stevens is a poet, and he writes, Even in contentment, I feel the need for some imperishable bliss. Even in contentment, I feel the need for some imperishable bliss. What is he saying? Even when we get what we want, even when we find contentment in our circumstances, there's an awareness, there's a recognition that it's not going to last. It's fleeting. We want something imperishable, something that will last. And Wallace says, when we realize this, the moment you realize it's over, it's like a dagger in the heart. It's painful when this longing for imperishable contentment is stirred because we know we're not going to find it anywhere on earth. I think this is why C.S. Lewis writes, If I find in myself a desire which no experience can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. So how is your contentment? How is your contentment when you're yet to reach what you want? Or when your circumstances take a turn for the worse? Or when you realize you can't hold on to your current contentment and it ruins it a little bit how's your contentment throughout COVID-19 and it's worth asking when we see these culprits of discontent at work in our lives how do we respond what do we do when we are in fact discontent how do we try to regain our contentment the pastor Tim Keller uh, says there's actually four things people typically do when they realize they're discontent. First, we blame things. So my girlfriend or boyfriend or spouse wasn't the right one, so we try to find version 2.0 or 3.0 or 4.0. A better one will solve the problem. Or my first dream was wrong, so I need a better dream. You see, by blaming the thing, we can then be driven to find the better thing, the next thing, but the then if we're always blaming things, we will inevitably keep on blaming them and we won't find lasting contentment. The next thing we can do is blame ourselves. Well, I'm the problem. I'm the reason I'm not content. Something in me needs to change. And you'll either get um, obsessed with self-improvement or fall into a spiral of shame. Those are your two options when you start blaming yourself. You can either improve and you got to keep improving to find contentment Or you'll give up on improving because you're the problem and you'll just never find it. Or we blame the universe. We we awaken this longing for some imperishable bliss. We want a contentment that lasts, but we also know that it's not going to be found in the material world. And so this universe is just playing a cruel trick on us and we settle for being cynical. We stop believing that we can actually find true and lasting contentment in this life. Or lastly, we blame God. We blame God. We say, why would you create in me this desire that you're not fulfilling? What is wrong with you? Why aren't you following through on your promises? And there's room to ask those questions. And it's good to ask those questions. But in blaming God, rather than stating the question, 
we actually cut ourselves off from the one offering us contentment. And in, amidst all these different ways of responding to our discontent, here's what's actually happening. We're in a cycle. We're saying, I'm discontent. This will fix it. Oh, it didn't fix it. I'm discontent. Oh, this will fix it. It didn't fix it. I'm discontent. This will fix it. Oh, it, it didn't fix it. And in this cycle, some of us are aggressively discontent and some of us are passively discontent. Aggressively discontent and passively discontent. When you're aggressively discontent, no matter how you re respond, everybody's going to know about it. It's the fix-it mentality. You're going to tackle your circumstances or your inner being or the universe or your understanding of God. Whatever has to happen for you to regain your contentment, you are going to make it happen and everybody is going to know about it. But if you're passively discontent, you might hope for change but you've given up in thinking that it'll actually happen. So you sit back and wait for maybe something to change within you, maybe something to change around you, but you actually turn in on yourself and you resign from engaging the world in a way that could actually matter, in a way that could actually bring about change. You might actually give up on life and just keep going through day after day. This is how we passively respond to our discontent. So there's many culprits of discontent, and even our sincere moments of contentment can lead to this desire for lasting contentment. But then we have to admit that the world doesn't have a power to provide that kind of contentment. And when we face this reality, we perpetuate it by trying to change things or ourselves, and we do this in aggressive or passive ways. So we've thought about what it is to be discontent, but now let's consider the secret of contentment. Paul says the secret of contentment has nothing to do with what's going on around us. It's not based on our needs or his needs being met. After all, he says in verse 12, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry or whether living in plenty or in want. Paul is well acquainted with the highs and lows of life. He knows economic prosperity as well as economic poverty. He knows what it is to have freedom and he knows what it is to sit confined in a jail cell. He knows what it is to be among the social elite as a Pharisee and he knows what it is to be among the outcasts as a follower of Jesus in the ancient world. Whatever comes his way, Paul says, I am content. And it's a stable and consistent, lasting contentment. And it makes you wonder, is this kind of contentment something that's only available to the saintly, the super godly, an apostle who piously floats through the challenges of life? No. Twice, Paul says that he has learned contentment. Underline that in your passage in your Bible. He has learned how to be content. It is so important for us to see that. Paul has learned the secret to contentment through tri trial and error over time, growing in his contentment as Jesus walks with him through the highs and lows of life. When scholars look at this word learned in the Greek, they actually think it's a divine passive, which is just a fancy way of saying that God is the educator, that Paul is in the school of contentment and God is teaching him every step of the way how to be content in this new circumstance, whatever it may be. But this doesn't mean that Paul is passive in his learning. He puts energy and activity into his learning. He puts the lessons he's learned from God into practice. And I'm sure like all of us, there were things that rocked Paul's contentment from time to time. You know, he was human like us, so there would be times he found himself discontent. But it was in the time where he lost his contentment or where his contentment was challenged or where he was facing discontent. It was especially in these times that Paul would have to lean in and learn from God how to be content, 
or to revisit a lesson previously learned, but how to apply it in this present circumstance. Paul wants us to know that his contentment is not just a philosophy and it's not just a good idea. It is the culmination of lived learning. So what is the secret then? What is the secret to contentment? Paul tells us plainly in verse 13, I can do all this through Christ who strengthens me. That's it. Now, weren't you hoping for a little bit more? Be honest. I can do all this through Christ who strengthens me. Is it that simple? And yet it doesn't feel all that simple? Like, how does this work? Is that the secret? It is the secret. We can be content in any and every situation, and we receive this through Christ who strengthens us. When Paul says this, he's not talking about a past experience, but an ongoing reality. It's not that Jesus gave Paul strength in the past to be content, and now that carries forward into the future. It's not that Paul somehow has stockpiled a reservoir of contentment that he can pull on now. Paul says that Jesus meets him and gives him strength, and that this happens again and again and again every day in any situation because Jesus is alive and well and his spirit is at work in his people and Jesus strengthens his people to be content no matter what they face. And this happens, Paul shows us, especially in times of weakness. You know, Paul didn't live a disembodied life. He he didn't ascribe to stoicism, which encourages followers to stop desiring temporary things and to just accept their lot. It's not terrible advice, but it's not the advice Paul's offering. Neither was Paul emotionally flat. He didn't just float through life unaffected by what happened to him. Elsewhere, he says that at one point he despaired of life itself because of how challenging things were. So we, we don't see Paul detaching from the world or detaching from his emotional life. And in Corinthians, for example, we read about how Paul had a thorn in his side. Now, we don't know what this was. We don't know what exactly was going on there, but Paul describes it as this ongoing burden that he talked to Jesus about three times, and Jesus finally answered. We read in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Jesus didn't put an end to whatever that suffering was in Paul's life, but he did give him a purpose for it and the assurance that his power is made perfect in weakness. And this was how Paul, even in moments of pain and even despair, was strengthened to be content even with a thorn in his side. So in times of plenty or want, in times of celebration or suffering, God continued to teach Paul not to rely on his own self-sufficiency, but to rely on Christ. Because contentment is found in Christ's sufficiency. Contentment is found in Christ's sufficiency. And I want to be clear. You're not expected to go through your circumstances dishonestly. If you're feeling pain, you're feeling pain. Be honest about that. If you're discontent, you're discontent. You can be honest about that. But no matter what we're facing, there's a continual invitation from God to join him in the school of contentment where he's our educator, meeting us in our realities, strengthening us to find contentment no matter what we face. But Christ doesn't give us some superhuman strength that allows us to go through life scot-free. He doesn't strengthen us so that everything always goes our way. He doesn't strengthen us so that we're unaffected even when things don't go our way. He strengthens us, let's remember, to find contentment in any and every circumstance. But how? How does this work? Well, our contentment is tethered to our hope. At his weakest, naked and crucified, that's when Jesus overcame evil, suffering, sin, and death. 
where Paul says elsewhere that the weakness of God is greater than human strength. And so the strength that Jesus has and the strength that he offers to us to remain content, it is not some weak strength. Even his weakness overcomes the world. Imagine what his strength can do. It's eternal. It's unlimited. It's powerful. It's sufficient for you. And so you can be content because this is who you worship. This is who you have a relationship with. This is who you know. This is who is with you. This is who's for you. This is who is strengthening you. This is who is at work in you and through you. So of course Jesus is able to strengthen you so you can be content, whatever is going on in your life right now. Now, perhaps you're in a place where you're grieved with God. And maybe you have legitimate reasons. And so it's hard to think about finding contentment through God right now. Or maybe you're skeptical about the claims of Jesus. Or perhaps Jesus hasn't made your life easier. It seems to be getting harder. But it's precisely in these places that we're invited to learn contentment from Christ. We don't learn it by denying our hurt or frustration or difficulty, but by engaging these realities head on with the God who deeply cares about us, who wants to strengthen us to find contentment. Or maybe you're discontent because you're walking in the hell of disobedience. Maybe you're actively and knowingly disobeying God. Maybe you're just ignoring the promptings from the Spirit that keep inviting you to realign your mind and your heart and how you live with his kingdom. And so is it possible that you haven't been finding contentment because you've been running from the one who can make you content? And maybe you're discontent because you've fallen into the trap of comparison or even coveting. You know, as the adage goes, comparison is the enemy of contentment. And perhaps even entitlement seeps in. You're discontent because you feel entitled to what someone else should have, and you think you should have what they have. And so it robs you of, of contentment. The good news is that we don't have to get our lives all cleaned up before we can receive contentment from Christ. All you have to do is be honest with him. Bring these parts of yourself to him and ask him to teach you how to be content in the mess even. And then let him strengthen you to be content. So he's not saying you'll be content once you get X, Y, or Z in order. He's saying you can be content in all things through me, even your own weakness, even your own failings, even your own hurts, even your own anger. I can meet you there and you can discover contentment and I'll strengthen you to be content. And maybe you're discontent because you've yet to place your faith and trust in the only one who can give you this contentment. You see, there's no shortcut to this kind of contentment apart from Christ. It's only found through Christ, not around him, not near him, not even from him. You see, Jesus isn't a sage who hands you a book with teachings on contentment and then sends you on your way to figure out how to put them into practice. The strengthening to be content in any and every situation comes through him, which means relationship and intimacy and interaction with him and dependency on him. The only way to receive the secret of contentment is to have faith in Christ and to follow him and to let him teach you and strengthen you. But as I said, Paul wasn't passively receiving contentment. He was actively learning and being strengthened through Christ. So what can we do in our day-to-day -day lives to, to develop contentment, to open ourselves up to God as our educator? Well, it's important to really grasp this. The Christian life involves a commitment to learn. The Christian life involves a commitment to learn. First, that commitment is a commitment to continue learning about ourselves. If you're discontent or if you're oscillating back and forth between contentment and discontentment, you need to learn about yourself. Why is that going on in you? What's being stirred in your heart? Where is your heart's functional trust? And if you're not sure, here's an experiment. For one week, Give up something you really enjoy and then watch how your contentment is. Now, if you're fine, great. 
But if you find that your contentment is easily rocked when you deny yourself a simple comfort that you're used to, pay attention to that. Don't heap guilt or shame upon yourself, but say to Jesus, all right, my heart is, is torn between multiple things. Teach me in that place what's going on in me that I need to bring to you so I can be strengthened and receive contentment. And so part of how we grow in contentment is, is learning about our souls, about how we find contentment, and how we settle for things that give us only partial contentment and how to bring our whole selves and all of we are to Christ. But that commitment to learn also includes learning more about God in Christ. If you want to grow in your contentment, grow in your knowledge of who Jesus is. Discover more about his character and his faithfulness and his promises especially in the Gospels. Encounter who Jesus is. Expand your knowledge of him and you will find that you're able to be content as you know more and more about who he is because he's trustworthy and he's powerful and he's an ever-present help in our times of need. And we need to know and learn more and more about who he is day after day day. But our commitment to learning also includes learning spiritual practices. We have to remember Paul's teaching on contentment in Philippians is at the tail end of his letter. There's a whole bunch of instruction that we don't have time to look at today. And throughout his letter, he continually calls the church in Philippi to a spiritual discipline of rejoicing, over and over again, he says, rejoice, rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice in any circumstance. Rejoice. Contentment, I'm convinced of this, contentment is connected to our practices of rejoicing and giving thanks through prayer. So what if you started a practice of spending a few minutes at the end of each day trying to focus on whatever was good about the day and thanking God for it? even thanking him for things that were challenging. But spending time in prayer saying thank you, even rejoicing over the little things that maybe happened. You might even try starting a gratitude journal by jotting down just a few things every day about what you're grateful for and cultivate this rejoicing heart that can receive small and significant things and turn back to God and say thank you. Or maybe... Once a week, you meet up with a close friend and you talk about your weeks, you share the highs and the lows, but then you spend time rejoicing together, thanking God for the ways in which he met you in the week. I'm convinced if you learn how to rejoice, if you practice thanksgiving through prayer, your contentment will grow and your awareness of God's activity in your life will also grow. So may we truly be content through Christ and may we be content in any and every situation as he strengthens us. Let's pray. After each prayer, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and you can respond. Hear our prayer. Father, we thank you that you invite us into the school of contentment that you are the great educator of our souls, that by the power of your spirit, you're able to strengthen us to become people who are content. Lord, we acknowledge there are many culprits of discontent at work in our lives, and you know them better than we know them ourselves. Help us learn, Lord, what these culprits are for each of us. Help us to meet you in that and to learn about your grace and your patience, and your mercy. And teach us, Lord, how to be content no matter what we face, even a global pandemic, even loss, even suffering. Lord, tether our contentment to our hope in you and your strength to remake this world and to bring about a new heaven and earth as you promise and to even see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, even now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, may our contentment 
be a witness to a discontent city and world. Lord, we can easily get caught up into the common human experience of oscillating back and forth between contentment and discontentment. And there are a lot of reasons right now to be discontent. So would you grant us contentment for the sake of our neighbors, for the sake of those who are yet to know you? May people see a uniqueness to our source of contentment. And may it draw people into your great love and desire to be reconciled and to heal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, finally, we bring the world to you and, and we acknowledge that there are legitimate reasons for discontent. Things are not as they should be. There's so much suffering in the world and pain. And we don't know what to do with it much of the time. So Lord, would you move? And would you show us the basis of our hope? Show us how to be faithful and how to seek uh, the good in this world and how to join you in how you're renewing this world. But would you also intervene and act and bring about your justice and your healing and your redemption? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, as our Savior has taught us to pray, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. As our service comes to a close, we have a couple of announcements that we want to share with you. If you're new to St. Peter's Fireside, curious about who we are as a church, or looking to get more connected, then St. Pete's 101 is for you. 101 is the primer to St. Peter's Fireside. It's a chance to discover who we are and what we're all about as a church. You'll meet one of our pastoral staff and figure out your next step in our community. Our next session will be next week on Sunday, August 23rd at 1 p.m. over Zoom. Register at stpf.ca slash events. Our annual survey is now live. Please take some time to give us your feedback and suggestions by clicking the link in the chat after the service. The feedback from surveys plays a big part in, our, in shaping our next steps as a community and will be especially important as we consider how to move forward during the COVID-19 pandemic. You can find the survey at survey.stpf.ca. God invites us to use our lives, our time, and our finite resources to participate in his eternal and infinite kingdom. Everything we have is a gift from God. Even in the midst of our struggles, anxiety, or fear, we recognize that God is our provider and God has given us our every breath. In these uncertain times, we still hope to be a community marked by our faithfulness and generosity. If you're unable to give, please know it's okay. We are here for you, and if you're in financial need, please email us to find out more about our community support fund. If you're new to St. Pete's, please know no one asked you here for your money. We hope this service will be a gift to you. The best thing that you can do is introduce yourself to us in that chat and offer your feedback after the service. But for those of you who call St. Pete's home or who are members of the body of Christ anywhere, you know why we give. We give back to God a small portion of what we have in response to all that God has given us. If you're not signed up for our weekly email updates, you can sign up at stpf.ca loop. 
Finally, I want to encourage you to continue the conversation. If you're worshiping with your community group right now, take another 15 minutes to pray and ask one another, how did God speak to you? And if you're not in a group, there is an open video group that you can join, which our host will post in the chat. Now, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that his ways may be known on earth and his saving power throughout every nation. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in God's peace to love and serve our city. Amen.